me start recording. Okay, we're recording. Uh, today's uh, class is about the world of Asiya, and particularly the advantage, the superiority of the world of Asiya. So in order to be able to explain that, I have to explain a little bit um, all of the worlds, and I will do that shortly, but I just wanted to, first of all, uh, segue into that through something that we spoke about in the last, I think it was last week's class, if I'm not mistaken, the concept of the Achare HaPu'ulois Nim Shachim Halavavois, that the heart, in other words, the emotions are drawn after action. The emotions are drawn after action. I spoke about this recently. I just want to point out an experiment that uh, somebody told me about, which actually um, a, um, a, a superior, an experiment in um, one of the faculty, psychology faculties of one of the big universities. I didn't read the experiment myself, so um, I might not have all the details right. Perhaps if anyone here knows of the experiment, they could um, correct me on this. But in general, the experiment was as follows. They wanted to find out uh, what effect certain facial muscle muscles had on a person's emotional state. And primarily what they really wanted to find out was if a person sort of fakes a smile, how is that going to affect him or her um, emotionally? So what they did is they devised a very clever experiment where um, they gave people um, a pencil and piece of paper and they had to mark off with a pencil like certain, uh, certain words or certain letters uh, and numbers on the piece of paper. Of course, the people in the experiment weren't told what was happening. So they were told to do it with uh, their hand, which they usually write with, let's say the right hand. And then do the next page with their left hand. Uh, Terry knows about it, yeah. And then they do it with their left hand. And then they were told to take the pencil in their mouth, like this, and write <laughs> with a pencil like that, you know, in their, uh, whichever, whichever way the head tilted, in their mouth. And then they were told to hold the pencil between their lips, like this. And again, um, uh, write or mark off certain things. And after each of these, they were given certain um, uh, kind of test, not test, but uh, um, um, certain pages which told either a funny, or they saw a clip of a video clip, uh, a funny story, or a, an amusing scene, or a comic book kind of thing, whatever it is after each of them. And they sort of tested the reactions, um, the person's reactions, um, in some kind of questionnaire that they had uh, to gauge what their mood was. And they did it in various orders so that it wouldn't be uh, the same order for everybody to, to, to account for that. In any event, they found that the people, what they were testing really was, again, the facial muscles. So when the person had the pencil in their mouth like this, which meant that they had to, in order to be able to write, they had to sort of squeeze their face up in a smile type, um, it's called a Duchenne, a Duchenne smile, which means a real smile, a smile where they use not only these muscles over here, but the muscles around the eyes and the cheeks and so on and so forth. And um, the other one was a, the, when the pencil was in the mouth like this, directly in the mouth like that, they were writing with their, with their lips, um, with a pencil um, that was put them the the facial muscles into a frown type mode a frown um, uh, type face and they found every time with every subject that the people who that whenever they had uh, a pencil in their mouth this way that caused them to use the smile muscles they were much more positive um, in their assessments afterwards than, than when they had the pencil in their mouths that way. And some had only one, some had only the other, and then they made it was a big experiment. Um, 100, and I think it was 136 participants to make sure that they could... Um, in any event, the point being 
that they proved thereby that fake it until you make it actually works. When a person puts a smile on his face and he tries to smile, not just with the Mona Lisa kind of smile, but smile with the entire face, practice smiling with the entire face, a Duchenne smile, which means a smile that uses not only these muscles, but all the muscles of the face, it actually has an effect on the person's emotions. So in other words, the action causes the emotion to be in a certain way. And this actually segues very nicely into what we're talking about today. What we're going to talk about right now is the concept of the worlds. I'm just about to share a screen. So the concept of the world, can everyone see the screen? I assume yes. Can everyone see the uh, world of world or planes of reality screen? Yes. Okay. Good. So, um, so these are the five worlds that are spoken about in Kabbalah. Again, it's mostly the bottom four worlds that are spoken about, not so much the primordial world. But let me describe them. Let me explain them uh, at least a little bit. And um, I know that we're starting late today, so I'm going to try and keep this um, class a little bit shorter so that we don't finish too late because I know most people have to go from places 11 o'clock or whatever. But uh, in any event, I'll keep it a little bit shorter than, than usual, so don't worry about that. <clears throat> um, okay, so the first world is called Adam Kadmon, or Ak for short. There's the Hebrew Adam Kadmon. Now, Adam Kadmon means a primordial world. It's a meta world, as you see, I explained over here, the world of full potential. What does it mean, the world of potential? First of all, this is the first world that appears, that comes into existence after the Tzimtzum. The Tzimtzum is a procedure whereby before, prior to the Tzimtzum, let me just write in the word Tzimtzum over here so that you can see what I'm talking about. Um, one second. Tzimtzum. That was the contraction. Contraction or... Um, well, we'll speak about it. First, let's speak about the Tzimtzum a little bit. Uh, prior to the Tzimtzum, prior to this contraction, which is not really the right translation, but let's call it that for the time being, prior to that, the, the revelation of godliness was everywhere. Everywhere. There was no place that was devoid of the revelation of the essence of um, the Orain Sof, the infinite revelation of God. There was no place devoid of it. But because there was no place devoid of it, it was not possible that there could be a limited physical, certainly a limited uh, creation, a finite creation within the infinite. The finite could not be revealed where, there were, where the infinite was, so to speak, taking up all of space. So that infinity, that infinite aspect, that infinite revelation had to be removed. Or it had to be concealed so that a finite revelation could take place. That is called the Tzimtzum. Now, I'm not going to the Tzimtzum over here. We, have another, we had another class on the concept of Tzimtzum. Uh, it wasn't recent, so maybe it is worth going into it sometime in the future. But uh, we did have a class on Tzimtzum. If everyone wants, they can go to the archives. I believe that it is there. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it's there. Uh, in any event, we will have a future class, hopefully, on the concept of Tzimtzum. The way we understand Tzimtzum, um, the, uh, the, there are actually four different views of what the Tzimtzum was. But the way we understand it prim primarily is that it was a concealment. It wasn't actually a removal of the Or Ein Sof, the infinite revelation. It was simply a concealment of the infinite revelation, which fits very well with the concept of world. The word world comes from the word He'elem, Olam from the word He'elem. Helem means concealment. So the, the infinite light was concealed, and then a new light which was measured and finite now entered into the place where the previous light was concealed, where the infinite light was concealed. The first revelation of that is called the world of Adam Kadmon, the plane of reality called Adam Kadmon, this primordial world, this meta world, this world that includes all of the other worlds within it. 
It's a world of absolute potential in the sense that it is, A, not actualized in the same way that the other worlds are actualized because actualization is when worlds become actualized, become concrete, so to speak, they become much more, it's a step down from where they are. So this would be a meta world. Now, let me give an analogy for this. Um, when you go into a library, so obviously the library is uh, primarily, well, it used to be anyway, primarily full of books. You know, it's full of computers usually, but anyway, uh, full of books. But the books are classified and categorized. Now, let's say, for example, you have a, um, uh, a section on, um, let's say, American literature. And within American literature, there's American literature from, uh, from let's say, the 1800s and the 1900s and the, uh, the 2000s and so on and so forth, the 20th century and 21st century, and so it goes on. Now, <clears throat> if we're looking at the individual book, if we're looking at the individual book, so that is the most concrete aspect of the uh, of the thing that would correspond, as we'll soon see, to the world of Asiya, to the details of the world of Asiya. But the categorization of it, in other words, the section of the library which it in which it falls, American literature or American, more specifically, American literature of a certain century um, or a certain genre. So that would be, that would correspond to a lower form of classification. The highest form of classification in the sense that we mean here is the library itself. Now we all know that libraries contain books, but the highest classification of library is that it's a thing that has to do with books. That would be, that would correspond to the world of Adam Kadmon. It's sort of a meta world. We don't know anything about the details of what will be. It's the potential of all books that could possibly be in this library is what library represents, the word library, the concept of library. So that would be like the world of Adam Kadmon. Now, the world of Atsilus or Atsilut, uh, sometimes they use the Ashkenazi pronunciation, uh, which pronounce a T as an S, uh, Atsilus, or Atsilut. It doesn't matter. You could read it either way. It doesn't really matter. But in any event, the world of uh, the world of uh, of emanational closeness, with the world of Atsilut, is the first world that is emanated from that meta world. It's really the first world, which is why we don't really speak so much about Adam Kadmon, because it's kind of a meta world. So the world of Atzilut, the first world that we're speaking of, that's called the world of emanation or the world of closeness. It's emanated but not created. In our analogy before, if library corresponds to Adam Kadmon, Atzilut corresponds to all the categories that there would be in the library, American literature, British literature, French literature, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, or however you categorize them. It contains all of the categories that would be um, broken down further at later stages. That would be the world of, uh, of Atsilut, the world of emanation or the world of closeness. Now, it's called the world of closeness because it's closest to the revelation, any revelation that we can have some grasp of what, what it means. Now, our grasp of this is not direct, like an experiential thing that we experience the world of Atsilut. There are certain souls that, that do. They're called souls of Atsilut, very, very lofty, very, very, uh, uh, very lofty souls, righteous tzaddikim. Tzaddik is a righteous person, a holy person, male or female. Tzaddik or tzidkanit, which that soul can experience the world of closeness of the world of emanation. The only way most people experience it is by way of understanding what it isn't rather than understanding what it is. Because it doesn't come into the category of experience per se. What it isn't, you can explain. 
it's not this, it's not that, it's not a third thing, it's not a fourth thing. You can negate from it the qualities which we are familiar with, it, uh, with but you can't describe exactly the qualities of, uh, of what it actually is. So, for example, um, uh, things like um, dimension, time, those kinds of things, all kinds of, uh, of attributes which are found in time and space would be negated from the world of Atsilut. It's an infinite world which cannot be described using the categories of finite experience. Where the, where, where, where the worlds do come into, um, into finitude in terms of existence, tangible existence, is in the world of Bria, the world of creation. This is a created world. Prior to that, the world of Atsilus is only an emanated world. It's not a created world as such. It doesn't have dimensions. The world of Bria has dimensions. The world of Bria has details. So this is our, our um, uh, analogy of the library would be one specific category, let's say, one specific category of books, American literature. Right? Then we get to the world of Yitzira, the world of formation. That would be even a more specific category, American literature of the 20th century, let's say. Right, the 20th century, arranged um, alphabetically. That would be the world of formation, the world of form, the world of where things are much more specific than the world of creation. The world of creation is, is still amorphous compared with the world of, the world of creation is amorphous compared with the world of formation. Now, when we come finally to the final world, the world of action, this would be the world of the individual books where you could look up and you would see that this is the world, the book written by, uh, give me a 20th century author, I don't know, whatever. I uh, can't think of one right now, but uh, the world of, sorry, let me just turn that off. Uh, the world of, the world of action, the world of details. Now, the way we normally understand things is that we're talking here about a descent, and indeed it is a descent. It's becoming more further and further and further away from the from the infinite light, which illuminates the world of Atzil, uh, the world of Adam Kadmon and the world of Atzilut and so on. It's getting further and further and further away. Until this world uh, says um, uh, it's explaining Kabbalah, the world of Atzilut is kulo or all it's all light. The world of Bria is all light, but there are some vessels. The world of Yetzira is said to be half and half, half light, half, half darkness. The world of Bria is, although there are vessels, there's limitations, but it's not yet darkness. There's only a shadow of darkness, so to speak. The world of Yetzira is light and dark, half, half. The world of Asiya is mostly darkness, very little light. So we can understand by way of the analogy of light that the higher the world, the greater the revelation, the lower the world, the lesser the revelation. Makes sense. And that is true. Now, let's just take it one step further. Each of these worlds corresponds to one of the svirot. Um, let me see if I can get a sphere chart up here. I think I have one. Just one second. Oh, let me remove this for a minute. <laughs> Seeing all my, uh, it's my daughter that you saw there. Uh, let's see here. I should have a chart somewhere. And I don't see it. Um, I have a sphere of chart somewhere here, but I don't see it. Okay, I'm going to have to open up. Uh, I'm going to have to open up a sphere of chart. One second, folks. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let's see here. Yep, here we go. Okay, uh, can you, can everybody see the sphere chart now? Ugh. Disappeared, huh? Mm. There we go. Okay. You can all see the chart now? Yes, I'm going to make it a bit smaller so you can see it better. Okay? Good? All right, very good. So, let's just make a correspondence now between the worlds and the Svirot. The sphere of Keter corresponds to the world of Adam Kadmon, the world of Ak, the highest of the worlds. The, world, the sphere of Chokhmah corresponds to Atzilut. Bina corresponds to Berea, the world of Berea, which is why Bina is called Aim Habonim, the mother of the children. Because she gives birth to, as we'll see shortly, all the other Svirot. She gives birth, that's creation. Yes, all of the, yeah, yeah, good point. Uh, Martin just pointed out. All of the Svirot are in all of the worlds. It's just that it, one sphere is dominant in each of the world, one or a cluster of Svirot is dominant. All of the Svirot, Svirot have, um, uh, are, all, are all there in all of the worlds. But just uh, as the Zohar, the Tikkun Zohar says, that Ima uh, Mekanana Bekusaya, Bina, finds its, uh, is, makes its nest, so to speak. Bina makes its nest in the world of the chariot, which is the world of uh, Bria, Bekusaya. Okay, then we go down. Chesed Gvura Tiferet Netzachod Yesod corresponds to the world of Yetzir, the world of formation, the world of dimension. Here you see the dimensions of space. There's six Firot corresponding to the six sides of space. North, south, west, east, up, down. Yeah, those are the six Firot. And are the six Firot of what's called Zer and Pin. And finally you get to the sphere of Malchut which corresponds to the physical, the, to the world of Asiya, to the world of Asiya, to the world of action. Now, the interesting thing is that Malchut is more connected to Keter than it is to the other Svirot. Even though it receives from all of the other Svirot which are above it, but in its essence, it is more connected with Keter than with any other sphere. That's why Malchut from one world becomes, becomes the Keter of the next world. The Malchut of a higher world becomes the Keter of the next world down. So the Keter, the Malchut of Adam Kadmon becomes Keter Vatsilut. And Malchut of Atzilut becomes Keter of Berea, and so on and so forth. So Malchut has in it a, a very unusual quality. The quality of being both the lowest, but attached to the highest. And that is in fact what the uh, Sefer Yetzira, the Book of Formation, a very famous work, originally compiled by Abraham, Avraham Avinu, but written down by Rabbi, the famous Rabbi Akiva. He wrote the, the work down. So there it says, Na'utz sofan bitchilatan, bitchilatan besofan, the end is wedged in the beginning, and the beginning is wedged in the end. The end, Malchut, is wedged in the beginning in Keter, and the beginning is wedged in the end in Malchut. In other words, there's a, there's a relationship between Malchut and Keter that you don't really have with the other Svirot, with Malchut and the other Svirot, or even with Keter and the other Svirot. In other words, Keter is revealed more in Malchut than anywhere else, and let me explain why. What is the aspect of Keter 
which is most, in, there's many aspects within Keta, but the aspect of Keta that is most important to us is the level which is called, if you have a look over here, Arich, Arich Anpin, which corresponds to the will of God. Now, by way of an analogy, when a person wants to build a house, if he imagines the house in his, in his imagination and he has it, he wants to build a house, he very much wants it, it's, it's, it's in his will and so on and so forth, but he never actually goes and starts and eventually brings it into action, will he have fulfilled his will or not? Obviously not. He will not have fulfilled his will until he has the house in which he can actually live, like the uh, analogy of, uh, you know, the story about someone who has a dream about, uh, about winning the lottery. And he tells his friend very excitedly, I had a dream that I'm going to that I'm gonna win the lottery. So the day of the drawing of the lottery comes and passes, and his friend asks him, did you win? And he says, no, I didn't. Ah, false dream. He said, well, I didn't buy a ticket. So you don't buy the ticket, you're not going to win. Right? So no way you can win if you don't buy the ticket. Same thing over here. There's no way that your will can be fulfilled. I want a house until you actually build it, and there you are living in your house. So in other words, the mal malchut is the completion, the shleimut of keter. It's the completion of keter. It has to go through a whole process, from will to, to, to chokhmah, to the initial spark, etc., etc., and the planning, and so on and so forth, and the dimensions, they're actually drawing it, and then starting to build, and so it goes. But when it's finished, then there's no longer a will for my, for, 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 to have a house. I have one now. So the will is now quiet. It's been fulfilled. The beginning is wedged in the end. In other words, when the end is there, the beginning is now satisfied. The beginning has fulfilled its potential. The potential of the world of Adam Kadmon, as we were talking about before, the world of Adam Kadmon is fulfilled, this meta world, this potential world, is fulfilled through the world of action, through Asiya. And that is really the, um, the most important thing to know, that the action has within it action within this world. Our world is called the world of action, or the lowest counterpart of the world of Asiya is this world in which we live. So that world of action taps into the very highest of the worlds, the very highest of the Sfirot. In fact, the entire process of creation is there only for the sake of the world of action. If we didn't need the world of action, uh, God would have stopped at Atzilut or Bria or Etzir or whatever, but he went all the way through to the world of action because that's the primary world. That's what he wants. What he wanted from, uh, from this world, what God wants from this world, is this world should become a godly world through our actions. Through our actions. So that concept of uh, the world of action is therefore critical in the whole descent of all of the worlds. This is the world of action is the ultimate purpose. And therefore, action can change everything. As we said uh, before, the emotional qualities and even intellectual qualities are drawn after a person's actions. Now, it's also true that the mind rules the heart. The mind can also rule the emotions. With a lot of people, however, we find that it's very difficult, difficult, it's much more difficult to control the mind than it is to control one's actions. So actions can have the same effect. They can also achieve things that, um, that perhaps the mind cannot get to. So for example, let's say a person is, uh, is um, stingy. Let's say a person is stingy. One way we can uh, get the person to change his habit of stinginess, his or her habit of stinginess, is by getting them to reframe the whole concept of giving. Why is a person generally stingy? Because he feels that, if he, she feels that if 
they give away what they have, if they give away what they have, then the end result will be that they'll have less. Now, although practically speaking that might be true, it might be true that if you have 10 bucks and you give away five of them, you only now have five. But there may be something else that you gain that you didn't have before. So it really balances out. In other words, you gain uh, uh, a certain positivity about yourself. You shared of your, uh, of, your, of your existence, of your wealth, of your whatever it may happen to be. And therefore, you gain something in another, uh, in another aspect. It's all um, um, compensated, compensated for. So therefore, when a person is stingy, so one can get him or her to reframe that concept that when you give away, you're really not giving away, you're not giving away of yourself, you're getting something else in return. Boy, this phone is busy this morning. Um, you're getting something else in return, which um, is perhaps greater than what it was that you, got, that you gave away. It might be on a higher plane of existence, a certain satisfaction in helping another human being, a certain feeling of, of uh, I did the right thing, which might be worth more than, uh, than a few bucks uh, that, that one spent. Just by way of example. So we see, therefore, that action, future action can be changed by reframing mentally. But it's also possible to reframe one's actions by doing the action over and over. Our sages suggest that when a person, uh, for instance, when he, gives, um, when he gives charity, just to use the same example, that he not do it um, all necessarily in one lump sum. Let's say you're going to give $100. Instead of giving $100, this is for a person who's, uh, who's stingy. Instead of him giving $100, let him give $1 100 times. The act of giving is going to sort of make a channel which changes the emotional structure of his angst against giving. So that's what uh, our sages tell us, that the, after many actions of this kind, then a person starts to change. But it's possible to change through action just as it's possible to change through, through uh, reframing one's thoughts, one's thinking process. Moreover, since the world of action is the ultimate purpose of all of creation, that the action is the main thing, the deed is the most important thing, like actually buying the ticket if you want to win the lottery. Therefore, there's an advantage of action over even intellect, an intellectual reframing. Because intellectual reframing is not yet an action. It doesn't yet lead, it doesn't yet lead directly, it's not directly an action. It may lead to action in the future, but it's not direct. Whereas this, an action, is an action. And since that's the purpose of everything, the world of action is the purpose, the world of Asiya is the purpose, that it should be good deeds done in the right way. Therefore, re reframing things or changing things through constant action has an advantage even over changing things through mindset through changing one's mindset and that is essentially um the the lesson which uh, i mean they use an analogy for this as well which is that when you have when you want to lift up something let's say you have a uh, a pile of bricks on a pallet and you want to lift up the pile of bricks if you just put on your forklift, like, you know, halfway through the bricks and lift up, you're just going to lift up the top half. In order to lift up all the bricks, so you have to put your forklift at underneath the pallet, right? In the, in the holes in the pallet, that's going to lift up everything. You lift up the entire thing by lifting up the bottom. 
from the, if you live from somewhere in the middle, you only lift the top half. If you lift from the bottom, you lift the entire thing. The lever, you use a lever to lift up things from the, from, from, from the bottom of the thing. So the world of action, therefore, is of critical importance in our changing our habits of behavior. Many actions make it into um, many actions make it into um, um, sort of a habitual idea. That habit, once habits become ingrained through many, many doing a thing many, many times. That ingrained habit can be, ingraining habits can be a way to completely change one, even one's thought processes. As we started off with that experiment, even just by simply putting the, by holding a pencil in the mouth and putting uh, one's face in, into a certain expression changes one emotions. One's emotions, similarly doing certain actions can change positive actions good actions, righteous actions can change even the emotional makeup and eventually even the intellectual makeup of a, of a person. Um, yeah, Dovid points out that uh, important to remember that only this physical world has a dimension of time and space, that all the higher worlds uh, are all totally spiritual worlds that have absolutely no physical dimensions whatsoever. Yes, that's correct. Uh, the world of Yatira has spiritual dimensions, but not physical dimensions per se. Right. Correct. Okay, so I'm going to stop here because I don't want to take it too long. Um, again, it's a shortened lesson for today. And um, we'll have to stop it uh, here, if that's okay with everybody.